Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Give you Ted B. from the Mark, Texas. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ted Bishop, and I'm an alcoholic. And it has been by the grace of God and with the help of the people in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that I haven't found necessary to take a drink since August 19th. 1974, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And I want to thank the people here who have been very kind to my wife and I. I had uh, three drunks that were going to come up here with me from Texas City. One of them got drunk, one of them went to work, and one of them got involved in a divorce, so I... I <laughs> <laughs> And those things always take precedence over trying to get sober, you know, so. <laughs> I brought my wife with me, and I'm glad to have her with me. Well, in November, we'll have been married 35 years. Margaret's sitting right over here. Margaret, would you stand up? And I want to thank Bill and Liz, the blissful connubials, for uh, <laughs> for their kindness to us, thank you for the for the for the gifts in our room. We appreciate those very much, and uh, I hope I haven't made a mistake while y'all were reading all this stuff. I may have to quit and uh, go to the restroom here. I hope none of y'all are in that situation. Uh, if you are, just go right ahead and go. Hell, you're not going to miss that much anyway. <laughs> uh, it's a lot better to miss than to miss. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I'm getting tired. I started this stuff in 1979, and I've been, I've been doing this kind of thing for 10 years, and I'm getting tired. There's really, there's really not that much to say. I have a guy that I sponsor, and he says that I drive him crazy. He says, you keep telling me the same thing over and over and over and over again. And he says, you drive me nuts. Well, what the hell else is there to say, you know? I guess... Say it, try to say it in a different way. Everyone has their own level of communication, and I think that's one of the obligations of people in Alcoholics Anonymous to tell a story in their own way so that we can reach people who can hear what we're trying to say. Uh, you know, I, I had a problem when I came to AA. I had taken all my feelings, and I had completely cut them off. I had no feelings at all when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought that the only problem I had was that I, I drank a little bit too much on occasion. And I remember after I'd been in AA about six months, I went to a conference in San Antonio. And the reason I went to this thing was that they had a psychiatrist who was talking. And I said, well, I think I'll go there because, man, I know a psychiatrist can tell an intelligent fellow like me something. And I went up there, and this, and this psychiatrist was, was quoting a little jingle. And it went like this. said, if you can smile when things go wrong and say it doesn't matter, if you can laugh off cares and woes and trouble makes you fatter, if you can keep a cheerful face when all around are blue, you better have your head examined, bud. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> and, and you know, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what in the hell he was talking about. Uh, I simply I simply couldn't figure out what y'all were talking about. I, the only problem I had when I got to AA was that I drank too much. And I was here a long time before I ever saw any other problem uh, that I had. Uh, I guess really there's about four reasons why people won't accept the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had all four of them. Uh, youth, health, wealth, and 
brain. <laughs> you know, some of these young people come to AA and they, they thought they, they say they're too young to, to, to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. I was 47 when I got the Alcoholics Anonymous. Hell, I was too young to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, youth is, uh, youth is always the one that, that the chance takers and they fight our wars and they're the devil may care people. So I can see that it's difficult, that youth is, is uh, an enemy of sobriety. And uh, I was a healthy person. I didn't uh, have any uh, real physical problems. Well, I passed out in the courtroom one time, but, uh, but that was a mistake. Uh, they took me to the, to the hospital, and they told me I was a pre-diabetic. And, uh, when, you know, when I got to AA, I figured I was probably a pre-alcoholic. And uh, that, 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 uh, that stopped me there. I wasn't wealthy, but I, I had means to live. I had a family. I had a home. And so, well, if, you, if you're successful, then people say that you have no problems. This is, this is a uh, criteria by which people base how well you're doing in life. And I was a successful person, so I, I couldn't see that I had any particular problem. And brains was definitely not a helper. Uh, you know, I was too smart for Alcoholics Anonymous. I could see right through this song and dance, uh, and if I was clever enough, I could sober up on my own. Well, I didn't, and I couldn't. And it, it took Alcoholics Anonymous for, for me to find sobriety, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, I was a, a judge down in Texas City in Lamarck, from 1962 through 1974. And during some of that time, I, I did some of the worst drinking that, that I ever did in my life. I remember I used to go over and open up the caravan club in Texas City at 11 o'clock every day. That's when it opened up, and I was the first one there. And I would go in, and I would order vodka martinis on the rock. And they used to have great big old olives in them. And uh, I said that the reason I went was because they had such good olives. And, and, and I'd sit there and I'd drink that, those vodka martinis on the rocks. And, and as I would say, I had court at 2 o'clock. And as I sat there and drank those martinis, it became eminently clear to me what I was going to have to do at court that afternoon. And I would sit there and I would drink those things until I couldn't stand up. And then I'd go over and I'd sit down and I'd start holding court. Court started at 2 o'clock. Sometimes it started at 3. And sometimes it started at 4. And sometimes it didn't start at all because I didn't get there. But it didn't make any difference, you see, because... I was the judge, and, and court didn't start till I got there. And they just postponed it till the next day. But when I could go, I, I'd show up, and they would bring people before me, for me, many of them just like you. And I would wonder why in the world you people couldn't drink like gentlemen, like I was doing. And I had just gotten from the caravan club, and I, I would be sitting there drunk. And I would be wondering why you people couldn't drink sociably. And the lawyers would present cases to me, and the only the only way I knew that they were over was that all the lawyers had sat down. <laughs> and I knew the case was over, and I'd I'd, I'd mumble something, and and the clerk would say, "What did he say?" And the clerk would say, he says you're guilty, <laughs> and the fine is fifty-two fifty. pay right here. And we'd move on to the next case. And that was, that was for me, a typical court day. And as, as the judge there, I used to marry a lot of people. I had a problem there. I'd be drunk a lot of times. But I solved that problem. 
I was also with the real estate man there in, in uh, Texas City, and I taught him the marriage ceremony. So when people would come to me to get married and I was drunk, why, well, he'd perform a ceremony. We got a lot of sinners running around in Texas City in the night right now. So. And I was, I, 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 was, I was a cute drunk. I always specialized in cuteness. And so when I was able to marry people, I'd say, now I hope that this marriage was made in heaven and it lasts forever. At the same time, I'm a little older and I'm a little wiser than you. And in case this thing don't work out, why, well, here's my attorney at law card. <laughs> And I created confusion wherever I went. <laughs> People would come to court and they'd say, you're not the judge because they've been married by the real estate man. <laughs> I was also the coroner of Texas City in Omar. I used to pronounce people dead. Everybody had a heart attack. <laughs> you know why nobody dies from alcoholism? So they got coroners like me that just go out and say, everybody dies from a heart attack. <laughs> and I went out there one time to pronounce somebody dead, and I looked at this fellow and I said, he's dead. He's got a heart attack. And so they moved him into the bedroom, and I passed out in the living room. I woke up in the ambulance dead. <laughs> they left the stiff. They said he looked better than I did. <laughs> you would drink too if you hadn't listened to stuff I had to listen to. We had a case there one time. We were trying a murder case, and they had this lady on the stand, and the district, the district attorney says, in what part of the anatomy was the deceased shot? And she said, do I have to answer that, Judge? And I said, you sure do, young lady. She said, well, Judge, you won't believe this, says, but he was shot right in the subpoena. He said, when the police got there, he was D.O.D. He said, what is that D.O.D.? She said, dead on the driveway. <laughs> we picked up a fellow for a seat on the car, and I said, how come you took the car? And he said, I don't know. The car was sitting there by the graveyard, and I figured the owner was dead. <laughs> We had a case of assault there one time. This gal had knocked off this other gal's wig, and she filed charges on the uh, one that knocked off her wig. And uh, so the wife gets up, and she says, I saw this girl she running around with my husband, and said, that's why I went over and knocked off her wig. And the girlfriend got up and she says, I've never seen this woman before in my life. I don't know who she is, don't know her husband, don't know anything about this case. Husband got up and looked at the girlfriend and said, I've never seen this woman before in my life. My wife's crazy. Somebody raised their hand back and said, Judge, Judge, you want an impartial witness? And I said, we need one. She come up and she said, all there is to this case that looked at the boyfriend and said he was furnishing the gas. I looked at the girlfriend and said she was furnishing the ass. So that's all there is to this case. <laughs> about two years before I got to A, I got a hair transplant. I was talking to Bill about one here yesterday. <laughs> I figured my hair was getting a little bit thin on top. Didn't want the ladies losing their interest in me. So I went to Pasadena and I went to this doctor and he said, we can give you 20 
Hair plugs right around the top of your head here. Charge five dollars a plug. You can have a luxurious head of hair for a hundred dollars. And I said, man, that's a wonderful deal. And uh, what they do, they take these little clippers and they cut out round patches of hair out of the uh, back of your neck, and they dig holes up here in the top of your head. And they take these plugs and they plant them. They they uh, they plant them right around the top of your head, just like that. And I stand before you this morning with 20 plugs right around the top of my head, right here, right now. And I still have this fear that someday all my hair is going to fall out, and these 20 plugs are just going to be standing up there just like that. <laughs> now, that's frightening to me. <laughs> They say they can get that stuff from almost any part of the body now, those plugs, but I want everybody here to know that mine came from the back of my neck. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, they give you an anesthetic and they, uh, it's really a pretty major operation. Man, I, they got through it. I mean, I had blood soaking through these bandages and dripping down on these old coveralls that I had. And, and I went home. My, my, Margaret said, you're going to have to go get our boy out of jail. He's up there for possession of drugs again. And so I run up to LaPorte and I said, I'm the judge of Texas City and Lamarck. My boy is in jail and I'm here to get him out. And the police sergeant looks at me and he says, the hell you are. And, you know, they were going to put me in jail. And some guy come by and said, yeah, that's that, that's that judge down there, all right. Uh, so, so, they, so they let him out. But I really don't remember much of what I did when I was drinking because I was drinking. And I don't remember much of what I did when I wasn't drinking because I wasn't drinking. I remember the resentment. I didn't know that's what they were then. But for the life of me, I could not figure out why I could not have all the money I wanted, all the approval that I wanted, all the sex that I wanted, and all the power that I wanted. Why in the world would a world be put together where you couldn't have everything you wanted? That wasn't right. And it wasn't right that it wasn't right. I tried to straighten everybody out so I could get what I wanted the way I wanted it, but they wouldn't listen. They retaliated. They put me down. Man, I resented that. Everywhere I went, people left. And I said, there they go. I must pursue them. For I am their leader. <laughs> and I said to hell with it. I resigned from the human race. I just, I just cut myself off from people entirely. Uh, when I got to AA, I did not know uh, my marriage date. I did not know uh, how old my children were. I didn't know what grade they were in in school. Uh, I could not name you uh, two people that I had married. I could not name you two clients that I'd had in over 20 years of practicing law. Uh, I was just I was just completely out of it. Uh, I never had any principles to live by. I never had any rules. I had. I, I tried to adopt your your way of living. I looked at other people and tried to, to do the things that they did. And uh, one of my first deals was of trying to please other people and do what, what you would have me to do in order that, uh, uh, that, I, that I myself might have some principles to live by. Uh, but I got tired of trying to please all you dummies, and I said, to hell with that. But... I never gave it up as a real principle of life. I tried religion as a way of life. I belonged to the church, the first Baptist church. 
They call me Brother Ted. I was dipped and I was dumped, but it didn't work. Or I could see there'd be some fella standing up behind the podium just like this, and he'd be saying something like this. Friends, <coughs> there's coming a day. It's going to be here soon. It's going to be here when you least expect it. It's going to be a judgment day. It's going to be a final day. And they're going to haul your butt up in front of this wide screen, and they're going to flash back on there every rotten, lousy, miserable, filthy, hateful, despicable thing you ever did in all your life. Man, I didn't feel too good. <laughs> you know, I got the idea in church that you had to feel bad in order to be good. I can just see all the dummy sinners sitting around and getting ready to run old Ted up there on the screen. They don't know their turn's coming up next. And they're sitting there saying, shame, shame, shame. You know, I've I thought about it a lot. And the only, only reason I can come up with as to why religion didn't work for me is that I didn't get 90 sermons in 90 days. <laughs> I tried success as a way of life. I was a judge, I was a lawyer, uh, high on the uh, social register. Uh, I had a home, I had a family, I had charge accounts at every liquor store in Texas City and Lamarck and, and one in Galveston, that's success. But the thing that I was looking for it wasn't there either. And I guess the I really I guess the best way you could describe my life was that I almost made it. Everything I ever did, I almost. You know, I was telling me about my feelings and and I tried to live on these on the on on this basis no feelings. I'd be sitting there in my chair and the knives and the furniture would be whizzing by my head. And I would look at this crazy, demented wife of mine, knowing that it was driving her crazy because I would not react to what she was doing. She said I smirked at her. But I found the answer with alcohol. And without it, I was a nothing. I was a dope. I was a sap. I was a wimp, but with it, I was magnificent. I was witty, I was charming, and I was suave. My God, I've always ached for suavity. And I kept on drinking until I just couldn't drink anymore. I mean, I just could not drink anymore. But I kept on drinking anyway. And it got so bad that I, I, I tried to find some way to control my drinking. And I went about it in the same way that a smart aleck college graduate would. I started reading books. And as a result of reading these books, I started jogging. But I got thirsty. I tried yoga. I tried transcendental meditation, but all I could meditate on was why the jogging and the yoga wouldn't work for me. <laughs> I tried uh, psychiatry. I went back in my youth. I found out I hated my father. Well, I hated just about everybody, really. <laughs> I wasn't okay, and by God, you weren't either. I've heard these guys at AA meetings. They said, if you just stay away from the places where you drink and the people that you drink with, that you won't drink anymore. And I tried that, and I stayed away from all the people that I drank with, and I stayed away from all the places that I drank, and it worked for a while. But everything I did worked for a while because I was a periodic drunk. And then one morning I woke up, and I hadn't been around any of those places, and I hadn't been around any of those people. But I didn't care. I just went ahead and drank anyway. It didn't make any difference to me. Doctor said I had uh, uh, some doctor at Veterans Hospital in Houston said I had a bad hypothalamus. 
this is the gland up here in the middle of the brain. And he says, when you get ready to think, just to drink this thing just goes berserk and starts spinning around in there and just goes crazy. And this is what makes you drink. And you know, maybe if I would have a brain operation and have my hypothalamus removed, that I'd be able to drink like everybody else. And I was, I was beginning to think I, I needed some kind of something. I, 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 would, I needed some kind of operation. But I got to reading on about the hypothalamus, and I found out it also controlled appetite and sex. And at that time, I was not willing to go to any lengths to get sober. So I didn't, so I, I didn't get that. Uh, I read some place that you could drink, drink an ounce of alcohol an hour, night, and day for the rest of your life, and it would never harm you. And I said, man, where's this information been? This is just what I've been looking for. I'll drink an ounce each hour, and then I'll be wonderful for the rest of my life. And I went to the bar in order to drink. I finished it in 15 minutes, 45 minutes to go to the next drink. I said, well, what I'll do, I'll have the next hour's drink now. When the next hour gets there, I won't have that drink. And I got drunk. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Tim Terry said I had the bad adrenal glands. And he said if I would take adrenal cortex extract, this would fix up my adrenals, and I'd be able to drink like it, like anybody else. And I went to the doctor, and I said, give me some of this adrenal cortex extract. And he said, it's going to be painful. It's, it's a large shot. And I said, no pain is too great to return to social drinking. And he gave me a large shot of this stuff in the rear end, and the only effect it had on my drinking was that I had to stand up when I drank. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken glutamine and tycopan as recommended by a chemistry professor at the University of Texas. Now I used to I used to take so many of these things and, and that, that my I'd choke and I'd have to have some alcohol to get them down. And I guess I've tried everything that I've ever heard uh any drunk in Alcoholics Anonymous has, has ever tried, and none of it worked for me. Uh, I remember I went through an abuse one time, and that didn't work. Uh, but I tried everything I could think of to do something about my drinking. And I was a periodic drunk, and I thought some of these things were working. And uh, I used to go around the streets of Texas City and Lamar telling all my friends, why don't you stop drinking? Why don't you do like I do? You feel better. You work better. Oh, it's great. Why don't you try it? And I, I thought that uh, I was able to help people with, with alcohol problems. I, I, I had a lot of brain damage when I got the alcohol anonymous, And I've always had these delusions. And I could just see myself up on a high mountain somewhere, and there would be people coming down the side of this mountain and up the next rise and over the next hill, a veritable sea of humanity. And uh, I would be standing there before them on the top of this mountain. And I would ri arise and, and I would give them this message. <coughs> Tired and weary, desperate and hopeless, Want a new and better way of life? Oh, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. For thine yoke is heavy, while its mine is light. Yea, and verily I say unto you, Go, my children, and drink no more. I was a crazy son of a bitch when I got to out of the morning. <laughs> Every time I stopped drinking, I always left a reservation. I said, now this is absolutely, positively, without a doubt, I mean at this time, King's X and Tickerlock all the way around, the last drink, never again. Unless maybe something comes up real bad later on that just makes it absolutely necessary. And you know, something always did. I tried AA without trying AA. 
I was campaigning for judge there in Texas City years ago, and I ran into an old-time AA member. His name was Sam Harkins, and this guy was always asking me if I would like to go to an AA meeting for some reason. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't want to go to an AA meeting. But this time he had a different approach. He said, Judge, we're having a conference over here in Texas City. We've got 500 alcoholics over there. Why don't you go over there, pass out your cards, and ask these people for their vote? <laughs> well, my God, I didn't think any of these kind of people voted, you know. <laughs> but... I wasn't willing to pass up any opportunity, and I went over and I said, my name is Ted Bishop, or I'm running for judge. You people are doing fine work here. Keep up the fine work. Vote for me on election day. And I had a special campaign slogan for the ladies. I would tell them, ladies, before you go to bed, think of Ted. <laughs> And I lost that election. <laughs> and Sam, this guy that told me to come to the conference, he said, why don't you come over to a meeting of the 518 group? And I said, well, maybe sometime I'll visit y'all. And uh, at that time, I was drinking with a millionaire in Texas City. And... Uh, he was a bad drunk. My God, he was bad. He, he drank a lot worse than I did. Everybody I drank with drank a lot worse than I did. And uh, his wife wanted me to help him because uh, I had told him that I had been staying sober using my various methods of sobriety. And so I went down to this 518 group and I told Sam why I was there. I said, now, Sam, I want you to understand why I've come to your group meeting tonight, that I, I am a friend of mine who is a very wealthy businessman here in Texas City, and he was too ashamed to come down here. And I've taken time out from my busy schedule to come down here for him. Do you have any literature that I might take to him? And Sam gave me a big book. And I took it over to him. He wasn't there. And I gave it to his wife. Well, I didn't give it to her. I sold it to her for $10. <laughs> and, and I I had to put the money in the plate later on. But, that, that, but she wouldn't, you know, I, I tried to give her the money back, but she said the book was well worth it. But it wasn't long after this that the millionaire came to see me. He had gotten uh, into trouble with his drinking, and he wanted to do something about it. So, And I, I had been to these two meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had been to this conference, and I had been to the meeting at 518, and there had been something there. And I tried to think of some way to get back to these to these meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous without anybody knowing that, that I might have a problem because here I am a judge and a lawyer and high on the social register and it would just ruin me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I told Billy, the millionaire, I said, Billy, I think I've got a plan for you. I said, why don't you go to this Alcoholics Anonymous? I said, I've been to a couple of their meetings and it's not as bad as you think. Uh, these people are all right. And I'll tell you what, in order to make it easier for you, uh, I'll go along with you. And so that's the way I got started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and I not only wanted to find some way to stop drinking, but I, I wanted to sober this guy up so that he would be grateful to me and give me his law business. Plus, his wife told me that she would give me half of everything they had if I sobered him up. So, I was going to a lot of AA meetings. As a matter of fact, I went to more AA meetings than Billy did. And, you know, I, I, you know it's, it's a wonderful thing to go to AA. People say they didn't like to come to AA at first, a lot of people. But, you know, I just love to go to AA meetings. Uh, if you're going to, to AA and you're not really an alcoholic, 
you can walk around those things and you can just be superior as hell to everybody in there, you know. <laughs> and so I just love to go down there to those things and parade around at those, at those AA meetings. And sometimes I'd go down there and they'd call on me to talk. And I'd get up and I'd explain alcoholism to them. You know, I could see that they didn't understand it very well. And I'd explain it to them. First stage, second stage, third stage, everything that didn't have a thing in the world to do with recovery, well, that's what I was telling them. Newcomers used to think I'd make great talks. They'd come up and shake my hands. The old-timers, they'd just sit in the back of the room, you know. I figured they were jealous because I had gotten it all together so quickly and was putting it across so much better than any of them could. And sometimes they call me to talk, and I'd say, my name is Ted Bishop, and I'm a lawyer. My law office is right down the street here, a couple of blocks. My law hours are 9 to 5. And I want you to know that I appreciate having an organization like this where a judge like myself can send people like you who need this kind of help. God bless you, and I'd, I'd sit down. I've been coming to AA about four months, and I got this big card in the mail. It was... Snoopy, and Snoopy had Woodstock, and all the little birds lined up in front of him. He had his aviator outfit on, and he was really laying it on these birds. And the caption on this thing said, If you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, baffle them with your bullshit. <laughs> and whoever sent it was not kind enough to sign it. <laughs> and, I, and I kept on and going to AA and... and, and, and People started looking at me funny in Alcoholics Anonymous. I could see that they were wondering what I was doing down there. This millionaire that I sent was doing all right, so why was I still coming? So I could see that I needed a little bit more cover. So what I did, I started sentencing people to Alcoholics Anonymous from my courtroom. And then I, that way, you see, I, I had to go down there to see that all the people that I sent to AA came. And I had to go down there to see that the millionaire came. Everybody, uh, people would come to me for a DWI, and, uh, and uh, instead of removing their license, I would give them the option of going to Alcoholics Anonymous. So everybody went to AA that came to my court. Well, there's one guy that didn't go. His wife filed on him for assault. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you an option. You can go to AA three times a week for 90 days. The guy told me, he said, Judge, I don't have any money. There's no way I can pay a fine. Absolutely impossible. I said, you can either go to AA or you can pay a $200 fine. And in five minutes, that guy had $200 sitting on my desk. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one that I missed. But... But I would send these people to AA, and then I would go down, and I would, had a little black book that I carried, and I, I, would, I would go around the meeting, and I would check off the names of the people that I had sent to Alcoholics Anonymous. I would say, are you here? Are you here? If you don't make these meetings, I'm going to have to issue a warrant for your arrest. I had people jogging. I was selling vitamins to the drunks. So I'd buy them for five fifty and sell them to them for eleven. Then I made a mistake. I went to a conference with Sam and his wife Celia, the Lone Star Roundup of nineteen seventy four in Dallas. And I thought that they were going to have me up there to talk about how us judges were sending people to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went up there, and, you know, they didn't ask me anything. And I got to sitting around this thing, and I really got tired of that. And about the second day, they were up in the room, and they were talking about this being a program of attraction rather than promotion. And I said, right, now, wait a minute, what we need is a nationwide campaign of publicity, put it on TV, radio, let everybody know about AA, let them know how us judges are sending people to Alcoholics Anonymous, and everybody will come to AA. And Celia, this Al-Anon, 
Aronon me. She said, Judge, there's a lot of people in this room. She said, Judge, just what are you doing coming to Alcoholics Anonymous in the first? Aronon me. She said, Judge, there's a lot of people in this room. She said, Judge, just what are you doing coming to Alcoholics Anonymous in the first place? Man, I didn't like that question. I said, well, I'm coming to see that Billy comes, and I'm coming to see that all these people that I sent to Alcoholics Anonymous come. And she says, I think you're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous because you are attracted here to Alcoholics Anonymous, and the reason that you are attracted here is because you are an alcoholic. Man, I had built that group up from nothing. (laughs) <laughs> I couldn't believe my ears after all I'd done for them. And I got out of there just as soon as I could, and I went back to my room, and I sweated some when I drank, but nothing like that night. Oh, the sweat just poured out of me. Fifteen minutes I was an alcoholic. Fifteen minutes I wasn't. Fifteen minutes I was an alcoholic. Fifteen minutes I wasn't. But the thing that really tore me up was, I said, what if I go down there, pick up a chip, join Alcoholics Anonymous, and then ten years later it turns out I'm not really an alcoholic, you know? (laughs) That would be ten years completely gone out of my life. But I didn't have anything to do. I wasn't drinking. What difference does it make what you do in Alcoholics Anonymous if you're not drinking? Your life's over anyway. So I went down that Monday night when we got back and I and I picked up a chip and I was quite sure that my life was over. And it was because life did not commence for me until I got to to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was not enchanted with your beautiful poetry. Uh, I wasn't impressed with your cornball signs. And I didn't want to hear about God. I thought that you were the luckiest people in the world to have a wonderful fellow like me consent to join up with you. I was absolutely convinced that you needed me, but that I did not need you. I'll give you idea about my attitude. Have you ever asked a doctor or a lawyer or judge a question and just have them look at you like you weren't there? I used to sit on the bench like this. I had some half glasses that I wore. And they would bring people before me charged with some crime. Maybe some of you have been before a judge sometime charged with some crime, some nature. You know what that means when a judge looks down on you like that? Huh? That means you are a dumb bastard. <laughs> and I am Mr. Wonderful. And that was my attitude when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And oh, I was terrified that somebody was going to find out that I was an AA and ruin me. It used to scare me to death. And I remember I was sitting there on a Friday night and some nurses came to an open meeting and I sat there through the meeting praying that the chairman wouldn't call on me. And he didn't. And one of those nurses sometime after that meeting came up to me and she said, Judge, she says, what in the world were you doing down there at that meeting? I said, oh, I'm kind of a spiritual advisor down there. They, they do good work. They do good work. But... You know, when I, after associating with the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, it wasn't long before I was telling people that I was an AA. I remember I went over to a sergeant that I had known for years, and I said, Sergeant, did you know that I joined AA? And he got up and he shook my hand. He said, I sure am glad to hear that, Judge. And you know, I'd always been kind of a secret drinker. Everybody in Texas City, Lamarck, and half of Galveston knew that I was a drunk, but I didn't want one single soul in this world to know that I was trying to change my life. 
And of course, I was trying to find out how AA worked so that I wouldn't have to do anything and tell all you dummies how it worked. And I used to go around AA all the time asking people, how does this thing work? I was at a meeting one time and this guy said, in order to stop drinking, it is first necessary that you stop drinking. Now, you know, I'd never heard that anywhere in my life. It, it, it hadn't been any of those books I read. And I said, well, that's not right. In order to stop drinking, it is first necessary that you find out how not to drink. And after you find out how not to drink, then you can stop drinking. But to just stop drinking without knowing how won't work. And I went to this guy and I said, how does this thing work? How do you stop drinking? And he said, Ted, just don't take the first drink and you won't get drunk. And I said, well, that may be all right to you. I said, but how about us judges and lawyers? <laughs> and he said, Ted, it works the same for everybody. You just don't take the first drink and you won't get drunk. Well, I could see that these old guys had forgotten what it was like to drink. They didn't, they didn't really understand how this thing worked themselves. That was obvious to me. So I took a leave of absence from Alcoholics Anonymous, and I got drunk. And I had to come crawling back to, to AA, and I have been brought here this morning to you at tremendous expense and no little inconvenience to myself in order to bring you this spiritual message, and that is this, don't take the first drink and you won't get drunk. I got to watching you drunk, and I could see that you had an amazing number of similarities. You were alike in an amazing number of ways. And I said, that's, that's how they stay sober. They have similar characteristics. And so I made a list of these things. And I called them the BBB of AAA. That's, that's the Bishop Big Book of the Association of Holy Anonymous. And this is in the form of questions. My questions, you don't have to answer. My questions, if you understand them, why you may be one. Why is an alcoholic always thinks that he's the most unusual, the most unique, and the most important person in all the world? Why is an alcoholic says, leave me alone, just leave me alone, but God just can't stand to be lonely? Why is an alcoholic can't be shown anything? Any wife I tell you, husband, old drunk husbands were turn on the road? Don't do that. <laughs> Why is an alcoholic can't take directions from anybody? Why does an alcoholic always think that he's entitled to continuous and extra excitement? And if things get a little bit slow, he'll go look for the biggest pile he can find, the one that's going to stink the most, and he'll start stirring. You watch him. Why does an alcoholic always think the other fellow hasn't got the least idea of what he's talking about? Why is it that most alcoholics hate Christmas? and get that queasy feeling every time they get a gift or a compliment. Whilst an alcoholic is never, 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 never in this world satisfied. There is absolutely no way. Whilst an alcoholic keeps on making the same old mistakes time after 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 time. Well, an alcoholic won't ask for help and hates even worse to accept it. 
was an alcoholic always hates drunk but always manages to get drunk himself. Why is an alcoholic must always have everything his way, right down to the smallest, most teeny-weeny, infinitesimal detail? Why is an alcoholic hates to stand in line or wait for anything? Why well, if an alcoholic just sits around waiting for something bad to happen? Man, I know it's going to be bad. When's it going to be here? It's coming, I know. I know. It's going to be bad, too. Well, an alcoholic always fine. You ever see him? How you doing, Bill? Just fine, fine. How you doing, Joe? Fine. Just fine. He's dying and he's just fine. You know, they go one of these drunk skinners and they got the casket open and you walk by and you, you stick your head down there. I'm afraid he's going to sit up and say, I'm fine. Did you ever get that feeling? <laughs> now, why is it that no matter what you say to an alcoholic, no matter what you do to an alcoholic, it is inevitable that he is going to drink again unless a miracle occurs in his life. I took your inventory, you see. Wasn't he need to take mine. I wasn't really an alcoholic. Now, I might have been <coughs> a textbook alcoholic, or I might have been a technical alcoholic, or I might have been a slightly alcoholic, or just about alcoholic, or almost alcoholic, <coughs> or merely alcoholic, or barely alcoholic, or on the verge of being an alcoholic, or if I kept on drinking, I was going to be an alcoholic, but I wasn't really an alcoholic, not really. And if you're not really an alcoholic, then you're not really an alcoholic, not really. Even if I was, I was a lot better one than you were. <laughs> I was different. There's no the one on the face of the earth who can understand what I'm talking about. Police stop me, they didn't put me in jail. They took me home and put me to bed. I'd get up about 3 o'clock in the morning, run down to Lamar Jail, and I had an old dentist in there. He came to AA later. He said, Judge, what are you going to do with this old drunk dentist? I say, leave him in there. He's a bad drunk. Now I'd go out to my car, and I'd get a pint from under my seat, and I'd take a drink. But you can see the difference, can't you? He was in jail, and I was out. He paid a fine, and I collected it. I was different. Well, some of the people in there, they started noticing my attitude, and they started giving me things to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I didn't have anything to do. I wasn't drinking. And before I knew it, I was going to these old AA dances, and I didn't even dance when I was drunk. And I was going to all these things and spinning around these floors. Every time somebody got sick in the group, I had to visit them at the hospital. And I never went to the hospital to visit anybody unless I could slip a pint to my buddy right under the doctor's nose. But I had to go visit all these people that were sick in our group. Every time somebody died in our group, I had to go to the funeral. I never went to funerals unless I had a pint hit out somewhere. The guy is dead, he's dead. He don't know whether he had his funeral or not. And I had to go to all these funerals. But the thing that they made me did, do that really tore me up was they used to take me in. We'd go around to all the homes of the people in the group, and we would sit there and, and we would visit. 
you know, just chit chat. God, it used to drive me up the wall. They'd say, they must have thought I was a weatherman or something. I'd come in, they'd say, do you think it's going to rain? How much was your electric bill this month? And say, my little girl, I was started kindergarten this morning, and I think to myself, the hell she did. <laughs> they say, you like to see our children's pictures and their children's pictures and their grandchildren's children's pictures, and oh, hell yeah, let me see them all, you know. <laughs> I, I was really with it. I was really with it. Uh, Margaret has a boy. It's her son. Every time I ran for office, his picture was on the front page of the local paper in handcuffs. Judge's son picked up in local drug raids. Oh, man, I really resented that boy. Nut farms, penitentiaries, drying out places, hospitals, halfway houses, quarter houses, over and over and over. And when I came to LA, my wife came to Al-Anon. She brought the wife of the millionaire to Al-Anon. So... She has been in Aladon as long as I've been in AA. And finally we got a report on this boy from the county psychiatrist who said that his brain had been so badly damaged by the use of drugs that he would never function as a human being. And uh, it was through my wife's training in Aladon, really, uh, because you know, I would have been willing to do it anyway. But uh, when we got this report, this, we put this boy out on the streets. And two years later, he sobered up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he has had various periods of sobriety. And he now has five, six, six years of sobriety. Uh, he founded the N.A. group in Texas City, and uh, we're real proud of his sobriety. Uh, and this boy whose brain would never function now has a job as an operator at uh, Amico Chemicals. He's making more money than I do. And I still resent the hell out of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're very grateful for his sobriety. Anyway, who was I? Oh, well, yeah, I'm still looking for this answer in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got all brain damage when I came to AA. I guess you gathered that. And we were in the 24 hour club one night. And we were up in Houston. We were sitting there, and I was with Celia. And I said, Look, look, there it is. The answer that I've been looking for in Alcoholics Anonymous is right in the middle of the meeting. Celia pulled me down by the seat of the pants. She said, Sit down, you crazy thing. You're disrupting the meeting. And I said, Look, there it is. It's the answer I've been looking for. And you know what it was? It was this sign that says, Thank, thank. Thanks. I got to look at that thing and I got to meditate on that and I got to thinking about it and I got to thinking about it some more and I swear I didn't know whether I was supposed to have a little think and then a great big think and another little think or whether I was supposed to have a big think in the middle and two outside little things and I got to thinking about that thing and I could not think what the hell it was I was thinking about. <laughs> Yeah, that sign almost got me drunk. <laughs> I've been coming over there about four months when I picked up the chip. And the night I picked up the chip, well, this millionaire asked me to be, be his sponsor. How about that? 
moving right along in AA, eh? I was an alcoholic five minutes, and I'm sponsoring somebody with four months of sobriety. And I proceeded to explain the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to him. It was a brief discussion. <laughs> and after four months, he took a 12-gauge shotgun, and he went home, and he blew the top of his head off. And the people, they called me, and they told me what had happened. And you know what I thought? I said, how could this guy do this to me after all I've done for him? What are people are going to think of me now? I couldn't save him. See, resentment and fear. Every time I try to play God, it happened. And I was walking along, had a funeral the next day, and I was, I was an honorary pallbearer. I didn't even know what an honorary pallbearer was. And I was walking along behind that casket, and I guess everybody saw me as an honorary pallbearer. But I saw myself as a pretender, as a liar, and as a cheat. And I went to an AA meeting that night, and for the first time in my life that I remember, I felt something. These people were concerned that Billy's death was going to get me drunk. I felt that. And I, I honestly do not remember ever having any feeling at all. That's the first time that I had in my recorded memory of a feeling. And I was grateful to them. And I, I can never remember being grateful to anybody for anything. And really, I guess it was at that time that I committed myself to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And while I committed myself to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, when I committed myself to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I didn't commit myself to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. i tell you what happened. I was a judge, and I was a lawyer who smart aleck his way into Alcoholics Anonymous. I came to AA to observe you and to see if perhaps you could benefit from my higher education. And I started sending people to Alcoholics Anonymous from my courtroom. And then I would run down to the local group and I would sponsor the people that I had sent to AA. And you know, AA was a magical thing to me at first. And that magic lasted for a long time for me in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was based on excitement and it was based on activity and it was based on being important. I would sentence the people of AA, go down and sponsor them. I would gather these people up and I would take them to all, all around to these meetings in the South. My Buick. I would walk in the meetings and you've seen me at AA meetings. I would walk in the meeting and I would have pigeons on the right. And I would have pigeons on the left. And they'd say, here he comes. There he is. I was helping others. I was attending AA meetings two and three times a day sometimes. And I wasn't drinking. And I kept this shit up for five long years in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And I'm grateful for it because I stayed sober. <coughs> but about that period of time, something happened. I got a resentment against somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't even know what it was. I'd never had a resentment before. 
And all of a sudden, I started developing all these fears, and I had never been afraid of anything that I can recall. I was afraid to answer the phone, and I was afraid to go to the courtroom. And if you're a lawyer and you won't answer your phone and you won't go to the courtroom, you've got a lot of problems. And after five years in that area, I was in worse shape than the day that I first showed up at the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was completely terrified. And I had never had that feeling before. Alcohol, all those years, had kept that thing in check for me. And after I got into AA, the activity and the excitement, took the place of that. So I had, uh, it finally got so bad that I had to do something. I took an inventory. And I can give you a very short rendition of my inventory. What it was, I had this terrible fear that I was unacceptable to other people, that I was an unlovable person. I remember I put down, one of the first things I put down, I said, I'm resentful at my father because of when I was very young, he told me that I was stupid, that I was dumb, that I had no common sense, that I would never amount to anything, etc., 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 etc. And I went to my sponsor with this, and I said, I don't, I don't understand this. What has this got to do with anything? And he said, well, Ted, you've already said that you, that you think that what your problem is, that you have this fear that you're unacceptable to other people. He said, why do you think your father acted that way? Why do you think he did those things? And I said, I don't know. I guess he's sick. That's sick activity. Only a sick person would put that kind of thing on a child. He said, well, that's true. That's true. He said, well, why, why do you think he was doing that? He said, can't you see that the reason that he was telling these, you these things was so that he thought this was the way to try to get you to do better so that he in turn would look better and that he had the same fear that you did, that he was afraid that he was an unlovable person and unacceptable to other people. And I said, well, that may be true. I said, but how about over here on this other page where it says I'm, I'm supposed to point out where I'm mistaken, where I'm selfish, and so forth. I said, how could I, how could I be mistaken in a situation like this? I said, he's the one that pulled all this stuff on me. I said, this is sick stuff. And he said, well, Ted, he says, where you made your mistake was, he said, you kept believing that stuff all these years. And you see, just because people say something doesn't make it true. And in Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time, we are given a choice to ignore the bullshit. <laughs> and I'm sorry for the bluntness, but I don't know any other way to play it. For the first time, we can ignore and put to rest all these things that have been bothering us during our lifetime. And you see, money was important to me, yes. I liked big homes, and I liked all that things, and, and I, liked, I liked what money could do. But even more important to me was that people would say that since he has those things, that means he's all right, that he's an acceptable person. I use sex in the same way. I always thought that you went after sex just for sex. See, but that wasn't true. All I had to do was go home. 
See, but if I could convince some gal and talk her into that kind of situation, then I could infer from that that I was at least as good as her husband or her boyfriend and maybe even better. See, I had to draw inferences of worth from my manipulation of other people. And that will make you a very miserable, miserable person. And I, as I commenced on, as I commenced on with the program, I, I, I could see that the thing that we were really interested in was not what we had done. Hey man, if I've got to erase, erase the deeds, I'm dead. See, there's nothing I can do about what I've done in the past. You see, there is no way in God's will I can unspool my neighbor's wife. I really can't. It just can't be done. What can I do? I can change the reasons that made those things necessary. And how do I do that? Through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And through the steps. I, who for so long, laughed about the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I discovered probably a prime defect of character. I call it clinging. I like to cling to my old ideas. I like to cling to my old concepts of God. I like to cling to my old attitudes. I like to cling to people. But you see, anything that you cling to becomes an idol. There's nothing to cling to. There's nothing to cling to. It's like people jumping, jumping off, stepping off the Grand Canyon. Three or four of them step off and they're all grabbing for each other trying to cling to something. See, I had to be willing to try to stop clinging to my past and to my old beliefs and to my old ideas. Because without growth and alcoholics anonymous, I'm dead. And if I'm going to cling to my old ways, there's no way I can grow. And it has not been anyone who does not have a feeling for five years in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, it's very difficult. And I have to go through actions and actions and actions before I can feel emotions many times. So it's been a long, hard stretch for me. But I'm grateful for the ride. And I'm grateful for you, for you people and Alcoholics Anonymous who, who have helped me so much and who have helped my wife so much and who have helped us become a husband and wife again. I appreciate that. I'm grateful to you. I thank you. I saw a statue one time. It was a good-looking statue. It looked just like me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a guy, Hercules or Atlas or somebody, and he was holding the whole world over his shoulder just like that. And man, he looked powerful. Those muscles just shone, and he was holding that thing up. And I kept looking back there and see that he had his slips on. I looked back there, and he's still standing there just like that, holding that world up. And that's the way I was when I came to AA, and I walked in. They said, 
you have any problems, any defects of character? And I said, no, not me. Look at me. Don't I look good? And I walked out of AA and I come back and said, you got any problems, any defects there? I said, no, do you have any literature? You slip it over in the pocket. And I finally got into AA and I, I started doing some of these things that I knew wasn't going to work, that I didn't want to do, and that I would almost give my life rather than have to do. And I started doing some of these things, and I had to put one of these hands down to start doing some of these things. And man, that thing really got to be loaded, and it really got to be heavy. And finally, I had to just throw this down, and I said, here, God, you take this thing. I was just playing like it was mine. I had to give up, and I had to let go. Thank you a lot, and good luck to you on the way back. <laughs>